Welcome to Devalue with Mike and Caroline, the place where we talk about art and money and how creative people are navigating the ever-changing landscape of trying to make a living for their work. We're going to be interviewing all types of creative people, and we'll be talking about all types of issues that creative people face. We hope you'll get something out of it. We're excited to welcome you to Devalued. Hi, Caroline. Hey, Mike. Who's on the show today? We've got Tristan and Liza Ann. They are both incredible musicians and songwriters, and Tristan owns Anaconda Vintage in Nashville, and Liza sells her vintage clothing in there and i love and respect them so much so i'm excited to hear their thoughts let's check out the episode right now it's like day two is always the best hair oh yeah but day one is like this weird fluff it is a weird hate yeah no it's always like a little too like looks like i just washed it i feel like a little like (laughs) chickadee who just got like dipped in some water and immediately air dried (laughs) and it's just like yeah yeah but your hair looks good today. So, Yours too. We've got, thank you. You guys look great. Are you on day so, one or day two? This is day one. I just, <gasps> uh, look at you. You're a day but one. so flat. I can't, I no. can't do many in a row. And I have multiple cowlicks back here, so it really just gets rough. Wow. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we've gathered you here today. <laughs> to talk about hair. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to shout out our favorite products. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about, um, things that we hold near and dear and uh maybe hate a little bit also how do you want to how you feel like starting it off you're so good at the beginning part well before we got on mike you guys were talking about like um that you don't have real jobs but but you work (laughs) every day so kind of when you were like how does the actual job of being a touring musician or a musician compare to what you thought it was going to be when you started you go ahead, Tristan. You can start it off if you're. Oh man, that's a really tough question. Um, it is. I guess when we're talking about jobs, I guess we should elaborate that nowadays you have to have a real job and be a musician, even if you're a successful artist and you have a label and all of these team, you know, team together and you're touring. Um, <clears throat> the conditions for, you know, a. Uh, the conditions for being like a mid-level artist are just not enough to be safe in in this in in this country and in this environment. So when we talk about it, I guess we have like many hustles. And mm-hmm. um, I started. I guess I've always had. A, I've always kept a job. Like the the very few times I didn't have something else, and I was just doing music. I found it really hard to. Um, first of all, not like fall into deep depression, but also. I liked always having like something to cut up my week and make me focus on, you know, like appreciate the time that I had to do music and sort of lay it out. And um, I liked to be able to pay my band. I mean, like, yeah, we're always trying to pay our bands and our artists and press yeah. merch and everything's super expensive. And then yet, like, we're getting paid less and less every single year. So every year. I heard a stat, and maybe Tristan, you told me this, that like, the um support like kind of the universally agreed upon rate you would pay a band to support you hasn't changed since the 80s or yeah. something it's like 250 dollars is like the industry standard to wow. apparently um pack six people into a van pay for gas pay for hotels pay for everyone's livelihood um and obviously there are situations where you have agents who can stand up for you and ask for more but it's interesting that but you that have has to... no longevity. Like they can do doesn't. that once for you on a tour and like mm-hmm. basically trick everyone and everyone's mad. Yeah. And they pay your, your guarantees and then you have to move on. Like you burn through that. Yeah. You can't, you, that's not sustainable. So like a really great agent is actually saying, going to say they're worth this much uh, in tickets. And then that translates to this uh, like really arbitrary number that's never moved. And a lot of the onus is not necessarily on the clubs or the agents. The onus is really, because agents are, you know, they send an email, they get their money, and you're the one who has to figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's really like, this is something that bigger level artists need to say, okay, I'm stepping up. Yeah. I'm not paying $250 anymore. I'm going to pay $500. Because I know that, like, one hotel room is $150 now. But we used to pile four of us into one hotel room, and this was before... 
you know, Priceline because I'm old, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> hot wire. <laughs> Hotwire. Hot <laughs> using, <laughs> using MapQuest to get no, from show. No, I truly toured with printed MapQuest directions. <laughs> wow. In the beginning. That's not <laughs> terrifying. To it, it's, it's like, it is, you know, there were maps and we looked at them and, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, right. So, you wow. know, it was before the iPhone. Um, so we used to, you know, tour like that and then all crashed together in one room and, all of that. <laughs> well, it's interesting though because it's like after the last two years of us experiencing a sense of comfort and being in our homes, I think our ability to just crash and get by and take less than what we deserve has depleted. And I almost like I have this sense of like maybe blind optimism that it'll just make us all ask for what we actually need and want and not take the tours that are like the whole exposure idea of like, well, you'll get exposed to 2,000 people a night who didn't know. I don't care at, at, anymore. Like, I'm so excited about all the tour opportunities, and I have probably, like, one in me a year of, like, I realize this is strictly an investment that I'm doing, but at this point, it's like, I have, you know, three people who whose livelihoods, when we're out on the road, are reliant on me being able to give to them and i i kind of want to be in a place where i'm like and i can give to myself too <laughs> at this point it's just like here's everyone's money we can keep going i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah there is there's definitely we'll see now in the beginning touring was basically promotional tools so you had your records and they were you know if someone wanted to hear you they had to buy the record and um your record label was making money and so they would send you on tour and it was promotional and you knew you weren't going to make any money doing it because it was promotional, and everyone had to buy the record at the end of the show, so you were selling yeah. way more merch. So you were making money not on really touring at the beginning, <clears throat> I think, at that point, or like if you were at a middle-class level, which I consider myself to be like a middle-class yeah. musician. So there was that way to do it, and then there were all these other ways of kind of piecing it together, and now we have, obviously, a streaming culture, so people don't have to buy anything. It's really just more of a act of charity when they do it or they're a record collector if you're mm -hmm. lucky enough to be like my fan base has always been kind of like record collecting people so it's been nice Same. which is good which is good every time that happens and they buy a record i'm like yeah this is just 25 dollars, but like thank you yeah that's huge because streaming the one song on spotify that has however many streams like it's amazing because it is exposure and it does affect people coming to your shows but it's like well, it's cool because you connected with those people. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't take that away, but that doesn't make the way you're getting paid right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, those people are paying a subscription. So they are paying for the music. It's just the way that they're charged for it has no paywalls. And the way that it's then distributed to the artist is totally exploited, exploitative. So, you know, I think that now what's happening is you're seeing, like, less and less records sold every year. You're seeing... Then that, you know, there's just not enough. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that you have like we have a responsibility to take care of our bands and mm -hmm. people. And um, I do think in the beginning you have this hope that it's going to get better. I always did like, oh, I'm doing this. I'm investing and it's going to get better. We can eat on $60 in groceries a week. You know, mm -hmm. we're good. And then I got to a point where I realized like, no, I'm actually just spinning my wheels and my team doesn't mind if I spin my wheels because they're taking they're they're getting paid everyone's getting paid mm -hmm. Spotify employees have health insurance and salaries everyone's getting paid and because you know uh, artists tend to be status obsessed or ambitious in a way where they're willing to like sell themselves short we still do it uh, and we know and we love doing it it's like every job that people love doing like journalists musicians mm -hmm. <laughs> um, photographers photographers any if you love you're doing your job it's like somehow it's gonna <laughs> the, the way capitalism works i feel like somehow you're not gonna get paid to do it <laughs> do you think <laughs> culturally it's because we think if you like it then that should be its own payment in a way because the rest yeah. of us have to suffer at our jobs and so if you don't hate what you're doing then that's that's your payment or it's just like that what you said about like the status obsessed thing of artists. Like I always think about it like a very good um, kind of focused in view of that is with South by Southwest or these festivals, you are paid nothing, but 
going there is apparently this really big deal. And everyone's like, oh, you're killing it because you played whoever the hit thing is house that year and you did this thing. And there's all these sessions and photos and footage, which who knows if the photographers and videographers are even getting paid. Probably not. Probably just because then their photos are being used on this thing that'll look cool. And I feel like it does feel good to feel validated. Um on the internet by doing quote unquote cool things that that prove that you're moving things along but i think you that feeling of feeling cool is not uh that does not a career make because careers are things you can build your life out of and you can't build your life out of an instagram post that makes it look like you're somewhere you're not you know which is so much of being an artist is you know making it seem like here's where I'm at and here are the shows I'm playing. And especially when you're building, you want people to feel like they're excited about and invested in something that's going to keep growing. It's a show. Yeah, it's a show. I mean, the whole thing, the whole is, thing performance. is a show. It's performance. And now we have social media so we can make things appear. Mm-hmm. You know, we were just so, uh, I was so driven in the beginning to like be working. And I used to just be like, oh, I just all, all tour, all tour, all tour, because the only way I made money. So, for me, it was like, okay, well, you know, yes, it's not enough. Uh, for some reason, we're still insanely broke, and I'm, you know, you know, I have nothing. And luckily, at that point, I didn't even have credit cards, so I couldn't, like, get into debt over it. I had <laughs> oh, to, like, figure it out. Lucky. <laughs> well, lucky. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I already went there far before that, <laughs> before I made the change. But my point is just, like, you know, you, you just sort of have this mentality of, keep working, keep working. And you also have like the hunger because you have no other way of making money. Mm. You know, you can come home and like get a job here and there, but you can't ever get a decent job because um, you're gonna, you're like gone half the year. And so that's why you see a lot of people in the service industry because they can pop in, pop out. But um, I think you're right. I think that the, there's also a responsibility on the artists who are, well, you have to realize that like most people who do music now are independently wealthy. I mean, you have to be like, if you're coming from a working class background, <clears throat> the only way that I've even gotten where I've gotten is through luck or like, you know, <laughs> something comes through that allows me to buy a van or, you know, things like that or working other jobs. But for the yeah. most part, what happens when you have an economy that doesn't even keep people safe is you find either you're going to get another job Mm -hmm. or the people that are doing it that seem really successful are the ones that have family money and they don't have to actually make money doing it. Mm -hmm. And they're able to just, you know, hire a great manager because the manager is going to get paid because there's money in the family. Do you see what I'm saying? I think there's a lot of that going on. And so it's frustrating if you're trying to actually, if you're like responsible for yourself, like I've always been responsible for figuring it out. I started in the Honda Civic, you know, with yeah, MapQuest. Me, you know? <laughs> me too. You know what I'm saying? You're responsible yeah. for figuring it out and you're thinking this is going to get better, it's going to get easier, but it never really does. It's just gotten harder. Mm-hmm. But you're, but in a way, like when you were saying in the beginning that you wanted to just work and work and work and that meant touring because that was the only way you could make money. But now like the CEO of Spotify says, uh, if you're an artist, if you're a musician, you should just release more music if you want to make money. And that kind of, for album how artists, do you like, release? How do you release music? Like, how do you make music? You still have to pay the piano tuner. You still have to uh, maintain all the gear in the studio. You still have to pay musicians to come in and play to make the albums. You still have to get it mastered. And um, mm-hmm. so the funny thing about that is like, yes, but now we have labels that don't pay you to make albums anymore. When I started... My first album, I had a really, you know, healthy little fat advance and I could pay everybody who had made my record. But now there's no, there's no more, um, it's on the onus is now on the artist to pay to make the record, which is like, well, how do you do that? Yeah. And then it kind of diminishes also, I would imagine the quality of the overall, of, of the end product or of the end album, because you're rushing it out because you're, that's one of the only ways you can get paid or the only way you can stay relevant. So is that's this... classic. That's a classic worker uh, exploit the worker line because it. That's basically saying we'll work more. <laughs> no, that's exactly what he's saying, and it's horrible. Right. He's yeah. he's he's um he's so unabashedly like evil. you know def- defined evil about the whole thing. Um, yeah. 
that I, you know, I just really hope everybody cancels their Spotify accounts. <laughs> Here's the thing, like, you know, they, they, they throw you, the problem for like someone like me is I, they throw you a playlist and that is money, you know, so you can't say no to it. So you're kind of locked in like, like well, capitalism in general. It's also interesting because I feel really similarly, but also like when I was touring, like pre-pandemic, when I was touring my record, Fine But Dying, that came out, there was such a direct correlation to brand new super fans and Spotify playlists. Like almost, I mean, we were selling out every single show and it was because people were like, you were on my Discover Weekly this week. Like it... So I have this mixed feeling, like obviously in a pandemic world, everything feels completely devoid of any positive impact because everything's so oversaturated and people are constantly putting out new music and the only way, people's only comment on what artists should be doing right now is more content all the time. And so I'm still figuring out how I feel about everything now, but for me, like pre-pandemic, it was changing my life that my song was freely accessible to people because I was seeing it turn into like real ticket sales and then people would buy the vinyl. It, that came, like, it was very, part of me is like, I'm saying that story and I'm like, is that a thing of the past though now? Because that was, you know, three years ago and I don't know what it would look like if, you know, we were touring Bad Vacation, like the newer record in a normal touring cycle. Would I have the same experience now that there's so much more music being put out and all these different types is of artists. Is that true? Is there more music being put out? I it, don't know. People say that, but I'm like... I feel it because of like TikTok and stuff. It's mm. like there are artists, there are bands and artists, and then there are this whole new type of artists that are truly just making these things in their bedrooms. And it's like, which is amazing. I'm like, I have no gatekeep. I'm like, I want everyone to make everything they want to make. It is just interesting now the pipeline of how we're getting music is rather than getting a full song, you might discover an artist because they have a 15 second song on TikTok, which I'm totally not against. If I was in high school right now and I had TikTok at my fingertips, you best believe I would have been on it every <laughs> single day. Right. But it's just interesting. Like there's so many different ways we're taking in music that I actually have no idea what's sticking what's working what's not working like but i'm just a, i'm a record lady i'm gonna put out but records here's <laughs> the thing I though i want to ask you a question about fine but dying that's the record you're talking about mm -hmm. was there i mean like my first instinct in my mind is like why was that why are we giving spotify credit for that yes <clears throat> the algorithm brings music to people and if it <clears throat> you know it, it does help to connect you to people but you can also be on a playlist that's like the coffee shop playlist and like you're in the background mm -hmm. and you're getting those streams. Like some, you made that music and then people connected to it enough to save it and then enough to come out to the show. Yeah. And I, I just feel like, I feel like, yes, it's a tool that is an interesting way of connect. Right. So what you're saying is like the internet is a way that we can now really rapidly connect with people all over. And so your music mm -hmm. can reach people through that tool and it's i think tool. that's valid i just think that like and it does break down the old it does disrupt the old channels which is amazing mm -hmm. right because if you think about it before you had to get on the radio mm -hmm. right what was the other primary way you would share and connect it was word of mouth and there were so many gatekeepers so you had to have like a label yeah i don't know mm -hmm. And Spotify is slowly becoming that, or maybe quickly, depending on your concept of time. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's it's a technology and it's selling artists' work as its own when really it's an algorithm that we're paying for. We're paying for the service of being connected to music that we like. Mm -hmm. But so I brought both of you in here because I love your music independently but I also see a lot of similarities uh, in your trajectory. So you both are great artists, musicians. Uh, you work with other people. You seem very um, thoughtful in your creation and in your way of living life in general. Um, and you're Twins. women in the industry, you know, doing the thing. But you also uh, have a well-rounded way of making money i mean you both do the vintage thing that's like something that i think 
people can um, benefit from is like thinking further outside of just their music. Like I make music, but I'm also a person who enjoys this thing. So I will try to make money doing that. Um, And you're both trying to like live normal lives outside of that and have a full human experience. That seems difficult to balance all of those things. It is difficult to balance. That's a great way to put it. I also feel like it was even more difficult to balance when there was so much pressure on one thing. Like, I think people are, we're made to be well-rounded. Like, we're made to have so many things we're interested in. And and I think when, like, making music for a living, which I love, like, I wouldn't do anything else with my life. It is just, like, it takes up every single corner of your brain all the time, no matter the team you have around you so far as I've experienced like you never get to let go no and you don't which I love because I'm obsessed with working I think I'm a workaholic like a million percent you're I'm industrious other, me too I'm, a I'm workaholic yeah for sure. I'm yes. other aholics as well but it's workaholic a, it's a, it's for actually sure super <laughs> the only time being a workaholic really will come into play is when you have your children I know and then you have to make sure that you aren't really like if you really look up what being a workaholic is like People who grew up with workaholics and and, and that relationship. So, you know, Mm -hmm. but before that, there are so many benefits because, you you know, as a parent, you would become like a good provider because you're a workaholic, right? Workaholics are usually good providers, but the children end up feeling completely emotionally ignored. They feel totally ignored and isolated, even though they're around people, you know, anyway. And even though they're getting everything they need, it's like. They're not getting any emotional fulfillment or time or quality time or attention. And even when they're with the parent that's a workaholic, the parent is so obsessed with their work that they don't even engage with the child. So anyway, there's a lot of cool stuff in that psychology yeah. of workaholism. Which but- also about workaholism, <clears throat> I think with music, like it's this really hilarious thing. Cause it's like, I love my job. Why wouldn't I do this every single day all the time? I love thinking about music. It's fine that it's all I can think about. And when I close my eyes to have a moment of rest, all I'm thinking about is it's not even bad things. It's like album art, new songs, writing songs, thinking about how the songs will come out, thinking about how people would react to them. It's like all very fun things to think about. But what I've been thankful for in the last two years of kind of the forced balance that had to enter life when the pandemic started because music was like and still is other than doing vintage like but before the pandemic it was my only stream of income for like eight years and then when the pandemic happened it's like there was just this bizarre everything got canceled all like the record that I had just made with my label arts and crafts like it was just this terrifying feeling of like they just invested this money into this thing like now we can't tour it and now we can't whatever and as much as there's so much grief associated with the two years I'm so thankful for the opportunity of getting excited about other things that came into my life and being able to I'd always collected vintage and sold it but like when I I started working at Anaconda part-time just behind the counter and then Tristan was like you should start selling vintage here and it literally has changed my life because now I enjoy music 10 times more because I can let my brain breathe and know that like I'm gonna sell some cool clothes this month and you that's gonna happen. You can also say no. Like yeah. you can say no to things that are exploitative because you don't need to make money anymore at it. You It relieves the whole financial pressure for your art. So your art becomes, especially because I'm a parent now too, like your art becomes really special and really just about what you're doing and you don't have to have the pressure of like I have to take that tour because otherwise how are we gonna pay the rent, you know? So now it's like, well, Mm -hmm. maybe that tour isn't really the best use of my time. You know, maybe it's better for me to do this other thing. But yeah, I also think that um, the way Anaconda is designed, it's like designed for me, like for who is like this job designed for me, you know, like I used to sell at Fond Object and I would go on tour and like find these weird thrift stores, just like garbage bags of clothes and just bring them home and sell them, sell it at Fond Object. And it's just a nice little side hustle. And um, when I opened Anaconda, it was not like, hey, I want to work seven days a week, 40 hours a week, at, have this store, and it'll all be mine, and I'll make tons of money, and all that. It was more like, okay, I'm going to work one day a week. Everybody who works here has to, like, do what I do. You have yeah. to be, like, on your, sh- you know. And, um, you know, I'll do my job to, like, oversee and make sure we feel safe and take care of everybody 
but like I'm not going to be there watching you. You have to be able to do it without me. And so that job is designed so because I'm really a socialist at heart and I don't believe that we should be working all the time, Mm -hmm. like going to work. I work every day, but I have it's like Swiss cheese. You know, I've got a lot of holes in there. Like I go for a walk. I do what I want. I wake up. You know, this morning I worked for an hour and a half on like a volunteer project I do. And then I was like, okay, I'm work- done with my work. Oh, I put the schedule out. And then yeah. I was like, okay, I'm done with my work for the day. You know, what do I want to do? Well, it's so cool. What you always said, like, even when I started working in Anaconda, you were like, this job is literally what you make. Like, you will make what you put into it. Yeah. And that's, and if you don't, if you don't care that month, that month of making a lot, or if you're on tour and aren't going to be able to restock, she was like, oh, you might make less, but it literally is just what you put into it, which I think is similar to music which is why i love it so much is because i can kind of gauge throughout yeah. the week and throughout the month like how much can i put into this today and most of the time i only know how to do 100 <laughs> percent because like, my yeah. brain is like <laughs> only on 100 all the time but it's helpful also another thing you reminded me when you were just talking about how when you have another thing kind of that you know is going to pay your rent you can say no to certain tours or certain things but another thing that happened to me in the pandemic is I feel like I now know exactly what to ask for and I know that there is money there for it to be given like you know once you see all the numbers because you've supported enough people or been the headline and seen support I just like on this last tour we did the initial thing was all door deals and I talked to my agent at CAA and I was like absolutely not We've been off the road for two years. This is the minimum of what we need. No we guaranteed means no, but guaranteed not to promote. Yeah. And <laughs> also, but then what I did was I was like, nope, we won't unless it's this. Like I mapped out the entire budget and told them like, this is the bottom line. And they got every single venue to go above what that was. So Absolutely. the entire, which is crazy. You forget that you can ask for what you need. And like, if they're not going to give it to you, don't play the gig. It's fine. Easy. We should apply that across the board. Right? Like, ask for what you need. Because a lot of times people will say yes. And the times they say no, like, there are certain times where even when they say no, you'll want to still do it because it is a cool experience or whatever. But it's like, you just have to value your work and time. And But I think that's another huge problem with musicians is that we Mm -hmm. aren't like videographers. And, and like, I can't get somebody to work for free filming. I, you know, there's... Art forms like graphic design, literally labeled graphic design, because if you label it graphic design, then your profession has a standard for how you get paid and people are used to it. Now, we are in the only art business that has decided, here's the entire catalog of music, take it and give it for nine ninety nine a month. Like, I can't go on television and there's one streaming service. I pay five. <laughs> I pay like five. Me too. Streams. I have all of them. <laughs> I have all of them. <laughs> and like, I can't say I want to watch Robert Altman film and his entire catalog comes up. Like, I have to say, okay, well, this one's free right now, you know? And I'll pay for the other one. And some, and I'm like, a lot of times I do, you know, I'll pay for movies. And so there's absolutely no reason why, like, we shouldn't value ourselves in that way and when you start to set those kind of boundaries people are really disturbed by it Mm -hmm. i find like even in the culture here with these cover shows that were started i mean i literally lived through them starting and catching on and it would be like oh well the band's gonna get paid but the singers never got paid but we were the ones with like all the fans that were bringing all the people and selling all the tickets and if you were to even remotely like stand up for yourself and say, look, you know, I remember one time I stood up for myself and I said, look, I just need y'all to pay for my babysitter because my husband and I work together and I'm just not going to lose money on this. You know, like I was just out of principle and I got such pushback on it and was treated like, and I, and, you know, and I said, I said, well, you know what? It's okay. Then I can't do the show. And I know it's in three days, but like, I'm just not going to do it. And you get treated like you're being kind of cheap or like weird or like you're a diva. Like, why would you ask for that? And I'm like, what do you mean? Why would I ask for that? Like, this is my job. And like, I'm showing you like when I showed the breakdown to my agent of like, okay, if there really is no door deal, let me show you how much I'm about to pay 
to do my job. Yeah, this you know, is, like it, everyone has to get paid. Like I'm not going to ask people to work for free. I don't do that. Me neither. And I've just been in so many situations where I say yes to things that even now, like telling you this, like what's right. I, I even make mistakes and I, you know, do things for free and I'm pissed the whole time because mm -hmm. it's just so disrespectful. I mean, there are there are pillars of the community in this town that still do that. They have shows, they sell beer and they don't pay the musician like pay me something. Yeah. Like just a token payment. Out of principle, I, you know, I can't say, hey, Liza, come work at my shop. I'm not going to pay you for free. You might it's meet exposure. some cool people. You'll, yeah, meet, you'll, some get cool you'll people. meet some cool people. Mm -hmm. Like, oh. Do you think that it's uh, the responsibility of artists at this point or any creative really to um, all kind of band together and say we have to come to an agreement of some sort on the minimum that we're willing to get paid for the things that we do, our time and our energy and uh, spending our resources. I think it is a group thing. I also think it can start just like in your own circle. Like for me, the way I do that within my business is I make sure that any conversations around money, per diems, show pays with my band, like with the players who play with me, I'm always like, here is everything you can see about this tour financially. Here's the rate I'm giving you. Does that work? If you're asking for more, let me show you where everything is and we can make sure if more could work or at the end of the tour, there could be an advance or not an advance. What, what do you call it? Um, when you get a bonus, a bonus, a bonus, you know, like I try to just be <coughs> really vulnerable and open around money because it's not my fault that the industry is, rung dry right now but it would be my fault if i wasn't openly communicating to the people i'm inviting in same thing goes with support that i would bring on tours like i give the most i possibly can and then i talk on stage about like please go buy merch from this mm -hmm. like there's just ways that because the system is already oppressive enough and there isn't much more we can always do there is more that you can do within your own orb but it is frustrating when you're like I can't pay these people more because I'm not getting paid more. But I've found with any financial discussion or hard business talk or any of that, it's actually not hard. It's just like vulnerable and you can just take the air out of the room and have it, you know, which is, I don't know. Yeah, I always just try to like make the same amount of money as my band. Like, I, yeah, this kind at of, least. It's just like split evenly. And then you have to also look at like we're now paying like retail prices for our own merch from our labels so there's it's not like you're selling like if people see you with that big wad of cash at the merch table or they see the big line and you're you're selling a lot of merch but merch is so expensive and you know i it it's just this rolling thing that you're just constantly investing in so mm. um i just have stopped really i just like my biggest goal in life is just to break even and or I not try to make any money off of music just to like pay forward. And if I, now that I have that mentality of like whatever I make, I'm able, because I don't have to like pay my rent with it or anything, you know, nowadays, it, it makes it frees me up to be able to actually make more money because I'm able to then reinvest in a lot of it's merch. Just investing. You get to do the rolling investment. It just takes some pressure off of, um, and then I can like, you know, everybody can get paid on the team and, I have such a different perspective now because I don't have to, I'm not like looking at my life and saying I need to pay for my health care. You know, I'm like, I have that taken care of. And so it alleviates a lot of the pressure. So that's my big advice to anybody starting out. Don't, th there are no longer the days of like me working at the tap room in 12 South and like my song coming on all songs considered and me like ripping off my waitress thing <laughs> and like throwing in and just being like, ah, <laughs> fucking quit you know <laughs> yeah like there's just no you know i love that moment because every every artist does that and then they like crawl back to a job like a year later like i finally quit my job and i'm always looking at my husband like not for long you know? <laughs> yeah. you're going to need a job again um and if it's not like what goes up must come down like you know there are these amazing people who end up like building furniture or you know, cleaning houses. Yeah, you know? it's not always like going back to a restaurant, but I think you always do reach the point of like, how do I find this to be fun again? And a lot of times it is through the lens of like, 
relieving that pressure. You well, know? and also, like, how do I make money when I'm not on the road? Yeah. I do want to take three months to be home. I do, you know, I am going to be home six months out of the year, and I need to make money doing that. Or I do want to, now there's so much financial pressure to make your own records, and you have to pay for everything. I mean, back in the day, too, like, when you went on tour and, and you got a deal, you had an advance, right? So you invested all that in your merch. So there's no more advances. You're expected you're expected to um make your own record and then like they used to give you tons of free copies as tour support. They used to give you money. My first label deal I had tour support, okay? Mine I had tour support for both my records and then obviously. Yeah, this I mean last one we didn't. Tour. You can <laughs> still have that happen, but that's like saying to your kid you're going to play for the NBA like the yeah. conditions of like major success and listen there is a point in success where you are going to make enough money and all of these problems we're talking about like don't exist anymore mm -hmm. but for the other 90 percent of us that you know fulfill a it's these smaller clubs you know the 100 cap room mm -hmm. the 200 cap room for those people doing those tours i mean i've met such successful artists with millions and millions of streams and you know it was like Cass McCombs that was saying that at a picnic table one night. Like, I just didn't never figured out how to make money touring. And then people are like criticizing. I've told that story before. And another one of my successful friends who doesn't tour that much, but she's pretty successful, said, Well, how big is this crew? And it's like, Okay, yeah. Point is, we always expand to what we're making. So, and my whole advice too is like, get a job, keep a job, find something you like to do that makes money. Um, that you can do while you tour, which is hard, but you can do it. It is hard. And then but you made it possible. It's Tristan. like the, I was like, this is the year the rockers went solo. Like <laughs> all of us are playing solo. And like, that's my, my big vibe now is like, hmm. if you want the band, it's this, you know, for me and buddy to tour, it's, I love your music and I want to do this tour and I'm pushing 40. I'm not going to sleep on the floor. So, like, I'm probably going to lose money because I'm going I'm to eat really great food. And, like, yeah, you know, I just... You're, there's a level of comfort and self-care that you're not going to go back on at this point. No, I'm know? not eating peanut butter in the van anymore. I did that. I did that. <laughs> so, you... if it's so oh, hard... Sorry. Oh, no, please. No, no, go for it. So, it's it's obviously difficult, right? You know, we're... We're in a situation where everyone's taking advantage of artists. Uh, it seems oppressive all the time. So why do it? Oh, I'm never because we'll do never anything stop. Else. Because that's and that's the problem. We're a captive audience. Like we won't stop doing it. We just yeah, won't. It's because the glory. It's not even the <laughs> glory. It's like I feel like it's literally like the only. I think especially after spending two years at home, there's just no other thing that feels like performance. And there's no other thing that feels like making a record. And there's no other thing. And, you know, it's like the person who decides to move to Alaska and work at a brewery because they want to be in Alaska and living in. Like, I just, no matter what it takes to be able to do this thing, I'm committed to doing it. And I'm also committed to trying to push forward a version of this that actually is sustainable and is not only for the upper class musician but like the middle class like you're talking about this middle class musician that's like we are selling out 250 to 500 cap rooms we are pulling in people who are like screaming and crying and like wailing with us in these venues like there's a space for this thing and it actually is a space that i think could hold you know, financial benefit for the artists. And I think it's just like wonky right now. And I know it's like blindly optimistic to be like, I think it could be better, but I'm never going to stop doing it. So I'm going to make it better. But it sounds like you you're know? making the effort to really carve out a path that makes sense yeah, uh, for yourself and for others to follow, hopefully through, mm -hmm. um, you know, playing above board by using transparency to make finances make sense for everyone mm -hmm. and by being willing to say no. Yeah. And how do you keep these like pragmatic concerns out of your writing process? How do well, you keep nothing, the... it's not even, it doesn't even, 
It doesn't even go in the room. <clears throat> it doesn't even go in the room. It has like, you know, all of that stuff is also a special skill set. You can have an incredible artist who's like a genius. I have many friends who are like this who don't even have a pragmatic sense. Every person you see that's successful in music has that. Pra- Someone in the band is the pragmatic person yeah. taking care of that. You have to have that brain. Mick Jagger, you know, right? Isn't that the joke? <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> no, like as a creative person, it's just something, it, it's called libido, right? We think of that for sex, but there's libido in life and it's desire and it's, you either have it or you don't. And so people are like, do you ever get writer's block? Well, no, because like when I don't want to write anything, you I don't. like garden and I do something else. Yeah. But also, I have the desire to work on it. It's not, a, you know, that there's this book, I never read it. It's called the... Not Art of War. That's an amazing book that everyone should read, <laughs> especially any woman trying to do business. Yeah. <laughs> but War, War of Art. Art. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't even want to read that book. Like, I don't have a, I don't have um, any problem. Like, I'm not forcing myself a square into a round hole. Like, I just naturally have the desire to do these things and to work on things and to write songs and make recordings. And I love to perform. Um and so all of these things, like, you know, performing is interesting because it's a lot like being an actress where you sort of rely on being given the gig, right? Or you can, like, mm-hmm. find the gig and create the gig. But really, you have to depend on other people to help you to do that. But for making music in 2022, like, you can be completely self-contained and you can do it. Um, like I said, you just, you know, you have the desire to do it. and You, you can do it all day, every day. Yeah. And it's kind of free to an extent to do it all day every day as far as writing we're in writing we are in the age of mass creation so you know everybody can create and you have to flip it because we've been talking about all the negative but the positive is exactly that is that you can have a home studio and you can make really cool sounding things on your computer and so we're you know the tools are a lot less expensive at the same time so there's just this opportunity to sort of become the way that I've combated basically diminishing uh, budgets is that every, you know, penny I get, I reinvest into my studio and then I become completely self-sufficient. My husband about five years ago was like, I'm going to learn to mix records. And um, so, you know, like there are people who even take on the art merch part of it and like have all that in house. So as much as you can do in house and own the means of production in the more which it's, it's so possible nowadays it wasn't like that mm-hmm. 30 40 years ago again there was a lot of gatekeepers so you had to be a really great live band back then yeah because that was the only like way to get better and then you would like get a chance to go into the studio and you would make these records and the quality was a lot higher but now you can like do these at home things So there's the democratization of creating and it becoming accessible to everybody. So maybe that's where the oversaturation Mm -hmm. thing keeps coming from. But, you know, you can't be, um, you know, art is making art. It it gives people purpose. It's cathartic. And at the end of the day, like when you get all the pragmatic business brain away, like, if you are ever really struggling, like, people who are too businessy, it also really doesn't work. Because yeah. at the end of the day, the real, like, you know, the applause is great, but it goes away. You know, the really great validation from, like, a great review is great, but it goes away. But the feeling that you get, there's no greater high than, like, creating a dope track and being like, oh, that's rules. And you always feel that way when you make something. <laughs> it's seriously like an orgasm, making a song. <laughs> it is. I don't know if that's too much to say, but I... Why did it you is, say, like, we all, hopefully, no, hopefully I, we all have work We all do. We all need to. But I was, it's just like this And if there's no one to do it with, you can do it yourself. So you hopefully can. we all. Everyone should be having an orgasm. Yeah. Solo. Yeah. <laughs> you're the rockers. No, you're the rockers went solo. It really? <laughs> all the rockers went solo. We all went solo. Uh, no, I just think that it's like the most euphoric feeling. And it's not reliant on anything else. On it's anybody. It's just you. Which yeah. Which is amazing. And that's what you're always chasing. It's like dopamine, you know. It's like um, it's like scoring a, a lot of vintage bolo ties, you know. It's just yeah, like I, amazing. <laughs> I was in San Diego recently and that's literally amazing. found a hundred bolo ties for like no money. I can't wait. They'll all so. be in Anaconda soon. <laughs> um, but what was I? I was going to say something about. 
I think that to even like further answer your question of why do it, I'm going to be writing songs my whole life. So <laughs> it's figuring out how to interact with the system that's in place in a way that doesn't completely drain me. But all I want to do is write songs. So I'm going to do that whether or not things are working out or not working out. I believe they'll work out. So I'm just going to keep doing it. You it's know? like, you know, I'm at home and I'm goofing off with my kid and singing him songs and you know, my, all my family, you know, your family looks at you like there's something wrong all the time. You're like, Everything, there's something wrong, you know? Yeah. They're like, you should do kids music. I'm like, why, because I had a kid? No. Like, I would do kids music No, but you. I'm laughing because, but like, this is the thing. It's like sometimes you write songs and you do music and it's not to try to figure out how to sell it or package it. Sometimes like... You just want to, you know, make something and not worry about the other part of it. And to me, like when I get really down and out and things, you know, there's been times in my career where like everything fell apart and I and I had to learn something, you know, a lesson that I, I was young and green. I didn't have anybody leading me. I had to just like figure it out with my mistakes. Mm -hmm. Like I'll just take some mushrooms and be like, oh, create, <laughs> you know, like that's ultimately if you are not fulfilled by the art, there's going to be a time in your career where you are really depressed. It's, yeah, it's like everybody, like even if you get to a place like in your, you know, where you want to have a family or like Patty Smith taking all that time off to have her kids, you know, y y your career is one thing and your work is one thing. And then there's your life, mm -hmm. you know, and your career can only feed you so much. And your life can only feed you, your relationships can only feed you so much. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for ambition. Ambition is one of these things that's like fiery hot. It may, Like someone with too much ambition is like they'll burn you, you know, when they get near you. So too much ambition can really just scare people away. But ambition also serves to like get you places and help you accomplish things. So yeah. at some point when you realize that your ambition is, and your your dreams, you know, when you're young, you have dreams. When you realize that those are sort of making you punish yourself or not do what you need to do to take care of yourself, when you realize, when you take away the ambition from it and you you really make it like micro, like what, you know, making myself feel good but the work, once you do that and, and then everything that happens that's easy, like, oh, here's this tour that fell out of the sky or here's this, you know, amazing publishing company that you're going to work for now. <clears throat> All those things, they feel like gifts. They don't feel like, finally, I got this thing that I, you know, deserved. Yeah. So that perspective is huge. Yeah. And, and, and really like being realistic with your dreams. Like if you're going to be the next Margot Price, you don't know it until you are just becoming the next Margot Price and this is happening to you. Yeah. Um, or, you know, whoever, you know, she's a total badass. But my point is, she, you know, you, you can't, it's, it's, it's this reconciling of your dreams that you have to do in your, you know, you reach a point where you have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recently started, well, I guess a few years ago, kind of had to reconcile my dreams and be like, okay, I have no idea what I want to do or where I plan to be or any of that, but I can aim toward a feeling so a feeling yeah. of fulfillment or a feeling of joy every day and i found that my life has totally turned around since that kind of realignment and uh i feel like it's also like brought me to other people who feel that way mm -hmm. and um i think as a creative and watching other artists the people that i'm seeing that are are being successful and having what I consider balanced lives, they seem to be more in that uh, line of thinking. It's it, oh, it's like acknowledging, and I won't talk too long. No, either. keep. <laughs> I love you talking. It's just this acknowledgement that you're an ordinary person, and that the world isn't endless possibilities. Now you need that when you're young. Like you really do need that because. When you're young, you know, it's there's this ego and this awesomeness that like you need to because you're exploring. But there is a time in your life where you have to face the bravery and the transformation of. Like you said, you know, 
I'm an ordinary person. I'm going to find joy in cooking this meal or Mm -hmm. in my home, in my home life. Like, oh, you know, artists are expected to not have, like, I literally had a label tell me to put my things in storage, to be homeless, to continue to be able to tour. Um, There's this idea that you should have four roommates and take a vow of poverty and all these things, you know, but um, it's not healthy. And eventually the older you get, the more it's important to have a home life. And Mm -hmm. I think that's what you were saying. Yeah. The pandemic sort of forced you to stop and say, well, look at this beautiful, very creative. Because let's be honest, like touring is amazing and performing is amazing, but it's, you can't really be that creative Mm -hmm. when there's four other people up in your grill all day long, you know? Yeah. The creativity, I guess, is more in a performance sense. But yeah, it's just I think what you were saying about like the feeling. So many different things can hold a feeling of joy or a feeling of maybe success isn't even the word, but it's like. I love the idea of chasing the feeling of fulfillment rather than a specific thing. I'm such a goal oriented person that I absolutely have a laundry list of things that I'm like, I want these things to happen in my career and I want to be able to give people this because of whatever. But even more than that, it's like maybe what I really am looking for is an abundance of generosity in my life. And that could exist in buying flowers for my friend or seeing my friend buy a house off of tour money one day. Do you know what I mean? Like both of those things are the same feeling, just like the feeling of joy could happen if I sell out the Ryman on my own one day or if I get a new cat. Like rather than set these very specific goals, which I think it's important to write down the things you want because I really do believe in spell work and manifestation and I could go on that for a very long time. But even more important than that, it is the feeling that is the health of it all, you know, because if the goal is joy, then that won't go away once you sell out the Ryman because it'll come Because you'll want what's form. next. Yeah. And I've been around people who are super successful and they're looking up, you know? <laughs> yeah, there are. They're Everybody's always them. looking up. So it's interesting to me, like my brain chemistry is completely changed in the sense that I used to, I didn't have like specific goals like that, but you know, I had this like climbing mentality, like, you know, work, work, get, you know, go, go. But now I sort of have, I don't know, I guess, I guess I've like shed, I guess I have these moments when I had my first child and I have like a loving marriage and a child and I have a lifestyle where I don't have to do anything I don't like. Like everything I do, I like. I like my job. Mm-hmm. I don't have any bosses because I'm so bossy. <laughs> you are the boss. I'm so bossy. <laughs> You're my only other boss other than myself. And it just feels like myself still, <laughs> which is why I think I like it. I'm like, no, this is just what I would do. Thank you. You're like, excuse me, boss. I can do that better. <laughs> You're like, Give me can this. we do this differently? No, and actually. You also took a break, right? I mean, there was kind of a break between your albums where you were. I mean, of course, we're all looking to everyone all the time of like, what are you doing now? What's next? Yeah, what's next? Mm. And, uh, you know, I was keeping an eye on your career for a long time. So there was a moment there where you were focusing more on family things and other things in your life. I don't know. But uh, yeah. did we were talking about the workaholic culture before and how it's constant and you're expected to be on that grind all the time. But you took a step back and it seems like it really was a healthy thing for you. Did you worry ever in that time that not having constant output would uh, impact your relevancy? I think that that's a pressure that that you feel. But I think here, well, just to get back to what I was right before that, because I do think it connects. I had a moment where I thought I have a child and a marriage that I love and I'm able to buy a house and I I own a house and I literally have everything I've ever wanted. And I know that sounds very traditional and it sounds very sort of basic, but you know, I think that my career ambition just melted. It just melted. I just, I just sort of felt like I can make records at home. I'm very fulfilled creatively. Like I can write, um, I think more of the lull that the break, 
So every time I put out a record, I do something else in between. I don't do this on purpose, but it always happens. Like I put out the, you know, caves and then I was in Jenny Lewis's band and that slowed things down. And then um, after that, I put out sneaker waves and then I had a baby and opened the vintage store. And then um, now I put out my next record, Aquatic Flowers, and now I'm having another baby on accident. Like, so. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That is truly a pattern. Well, it's, it's seasonal, so maybe. Weird. Do you it think maybe it's a natural seasonal. thing? Be- Even though, because I haven't had babies or done the same thing like that, but I feel a similar, like there's been these windows of time that between anything I've done that have been very important because I think they've created a, a balance. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't have looked for that balance because I am obsessed with working. But. Well, and I think that a lot of times for me, I've switched labels for every record. <clears throat> so I might be working a lot, having like, but I've been like patient enough to wait for this label to come through. And then I'm on the label and they're putting me in the docket and it's six months. And so it feels like a long mm-hmm. time. But like, no matter what I've done, it's always taken two to three years be- between albums. So instead of like beating myself up and saying, why can't I just crank stuff out? I just sort of, I just sort of am comfortable with, it because it to me um i have like staying power in the sense that like i can just i can write songs all day long you know it's like not hard for you it's not hard for me you know and that's the easiest part it's so fun and 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 when you know you can do that you have kind of that confidence you just sort of wait but like i didn't feel the need like let me just crank out this record and like self-release it i to me, it's like I know what happens when you self-release, so I just sort of like there's a patience, and I feel like that patience um, mm. makes my work better. And also, I'll tell you this: there are, you know, a lot of stuff that just never comes out, and I've started to really like dig through that stuff and have like a good manager helping me do that. Which <gasps> I yeah. want to. We got to dive into this another time because I'm like, what do you do with all that stuff? There's like rec- every record you hear that an artist puts out. There are four more that are mm-hmm. sitting there that did not make it, but not even like didn't make the cut in the sense of like only the hits. And like, no, it's like just as good of stuff. That it just, just didn't, it just didn't time. get cooked up right. Or yeah, like for me, a lot of it's like the demos better than what we did in the studio. And- yeah, me too. Or, like, I didn't realize how good it was until I listened to it now, and it's five years old, and I'm like, holy shit, that's great. You know, why don't we do anything with that? Or I just mixed a song that's nine years old that we recorded during Caves, but it's obviously a very much a charlatan song, you know, from my first record vibe. Wow. So it doesn't really fit, but it's really funny. You know, there's just, you know, tons of stuff there, so you just have to take the effort and time to dig through and finish. Mm-hmm which is a discipline itself because if you're pushing forward constantly, it's hard to look back. Mm-hmm. But it's worth it to look back through that stuff. I, I do Patreon and it's really forced me to be in the habit of like pulling up, digging up like <laughs> rare stuff and besides and and have finished stuff. Um, but you, your question was good and I feel like I didn't actually answer it. But <laughs> I, did, I did take... I do firmly believe in... Um, and I see it a lot in younger artists and I would never say anything because you have to go through it. But I do believe that there does come a time when you want, when you realize your career is not going to fulfill you in a human way and your work doesn't fulfill you. It fulfills you in a certain way, but it's never going to give you what a home life gives you. And, um, yeah, it's like the Esther Perel thing of like, in within relationships this like social construct of monogamy not really being sustainable and realizing that you can't really expect every single um bucket of your soul to be filled by one partner not necessarily saying everyone needs to be involved in polyamory or not but it's the reality of we're serial we're serial uh adulterers yes and we need to like give ourselves like research yeah. has shown we that's what we do but it's like as a career it's like your career isn't going to fill up the spiritual the emotional the financial the relational the creative not i mean it has the ability because this is an interesting career so it almost like appears to be this all-encompassing you'll get everything you want come on in the water's fine like everything's well, and fulfilled the attention 
and the applause yeah. and the validation is addictive. So if yeah. you have a narcissistic personality, yeah. Which it might feel every you artist. Because it might be just the amount of narcissistic <laughs> supply you need to totally ignore relationally what you're, what not, you're getting. Get, not getting. But yeah. if you are a person that's chronically um, numb, like you get numb, like I'm singing in front of 25,000 people with Jenny Lewis with Mumford and Sons encore and my family's there and they're like, this is the most amazing thing. And I'm like, yeah, it's cool. You know, like, cause I've been doing it for seven months or eight months. Like you get used to things. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's right that I get used to things, but that's you normal. do, you get used to it in your mind and it doesn't, it doesn't attention and all of those things and validation, they work for a day or two. And then you're right back where you started from, yeah. you know? So to me, like building a, like I always knew I wanted to be a mother and, and building a family, like my life feels full for the first time. I think I had a lot of anxiety before. I think that, you know, I was, had a lot of neurosis and I had a lot of anxiety because I was just too focused on myself and having a child really filled up my life i feel my life is so full now that i don't have time to worry about anything nothing bothers me and i have i literally give no fucks about like what happens in my career my work is different than my career you know my work is very valuable to me and i you know have to make it work in small pockets of time and i'm really lucky to have a situation where i can do it but i mean i know it sounds cliche but i feel very much like Becoming a mother was something that needed to happen, and I put it off because of the work that I'm in. And when it came to be, I'm 36. I've got to do this or not, you know. Yeah. And then I'm doing it now. It just it feels I feel like transformed in a really healthy way. Yeah. I don't know if this is I this is not a fully appropriate comparison, but when I was just hearing you process that like the not the forced thing that happens when you become a mother and the thing switches in your brain. I almost feel like the two years of the pandemic for me personally were almost like this. I would have never chosen to stop or slow down ever. You could not have paid me to stop doing what I wanted to do. I was focused. <laughs> I was zoned in. And it was almost like this two year period of forced slowdown, forced presence, forced com only personhood, no performance associated with it. And I'm experiencing now, as I'm touring again, it's the first time I've ever been emotionally healthy and grounded while touring. And I don't think it would have come if I wasn't just a person for two years. And in the same way that you're like, when you're, when you had your baby, like you were like, here I am, like, I'm just this, and this is changing my life in this way. And it will never be the same again. I feel like I had that experience. And so many of us did like with the pandemic, I'm like, I would not, I don't think I ever would have come across this health at this age if I was not forced to stop. And I know? think that what you're talking about is, it's, it's not necessarily <clears throat> like, you don't need kids to do it. It's the transformation that you will have to do if you have kids. Yeah. But the transformation of becoming an ordinary person, mm -hmm. saying I'm ordinary, I'm a human being, I need you know, all the things that other people need. I need safety. I need security. I need a home, whether that's, you know, rented in a room, but it's a home, you know, you need, you need all those things. Those things are very important. And, um, and I think that when the pandemic hit, we found our home and maybe that was like, I don't want to live in Nashville anymore. I want to move back to be close to my family or, you know, I've been working this terrible job that I don't like and I want to do something else and total career change is happening, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which my husband did, you know, total career 180 <laughs> um, because all of his work disappeared, at least with Anaconda. We were closed for four months, but it wasn't going away, you know. But that realization mm -hmm. of becoming a normal person um, is something that I think young creatives especially don't think about when they're getting started. They think about the moment that you were describing in the bar where they ripped their apron off and then they have this superstar career but you've managed to find this balance between a creative life and a normal life yeah. and that, that's amazing that moment is really special though like the <laughs> moment it's, it's amazing like i remember i did it all yeah. i um 
dropped out of college, quit the four jobs I was working, and booked a one-way ticket to Europe to go by myself for eight weeks on this tour I had booked for myself. I did it all in one week. And my, like, why? How? But I'm so glad I did it. That feels very Liza. It was. (laughs) It was. Again, then I was like, I'm touring Europe. I can't be in school anymore. And it was like, what I really was doing was like hitting up random art galleries and bars being like, I'm playing here on this day. That's so funny. Like, not even an ask. Like, it was like, I'll be there. Yeah, I don't mean to like have two cool women on the (laughs) podcast and be like, okay, so let's talk about life balance and how you're being a woman and an artist. Isn't that amazing that you can do that? But But then it's like, a responsibility, I think, as no offense, uh, generally the more emotionally evolved uh, half <laughs> of the Come species on, to kind of pass on this knowledge that whether you've uh, had it forced upon you by um, a life experience like the pandemic that we collectively experienced or a personal experience like a, having a child, um, that you kind of like have these realizations and we're emotionally in tune enough to see it and hopefully like pass on this sort of information to other people kind of trying to follow a pathway to um a lifelong creative career yeah yeah like to say okay i live you know i'm able to be like this weird artist and i just make that's just who i am i I, I, my husband and i say this all the time we're like You know, there's no expectations for fame. There's no expectations for career, like these big moments in our career. But we do get to live our life as artists as like almost like we're retired, but we're not, you know, like we just get to make what you want to make. Yeah. When you want to make it. I wish everyone could live like that in a way. Not that they need to like all make things all the time, but live in a way that they don't have to do anything they don't want to do. Yeah. It's a, Mm -hmm. my aunt said this to me last week and I like, I've just been saying it over and over again. She said, my son said to me, I've just never found anything that I really wanted to do. Nothing ever called to me. I just have always felt pretty lost. And she said to me, the fact that you even have something that you really love to do, that you like to do, that's a gift in itself. It is a gift in itself. To be able to be that focused, you know, and industrious towards something. And yes, you know, the maybe the rewards financially are very little, but the quality of life, you know, there there are choices that you make. It's like when, when I opened Anaconda, it was like, yes, I could try to just do this all on my own and make all the money. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not a pirate, you know? <laughs> I like it, you know, a crew and I didn't, I didn't want to work. You know, yeah, I could I could work seven days a week at it. And make more money, but I don't want to. You know, I want, I, I have enough. What's enough, you know? That's what you have to decide for yourself. Like, what's enough? Do we need, like, these huge houses? I mean, you see these huge houses, you're like, gosh, who's cleaning all these other people? But, like, yeah. <laughs> like, like my, house, my little house feels so huge. <laughs> I have to clean it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, ah! <laughs> I never, like, I want a really small house, you know? Um, but I don't know. I think that I'm just a very simple I'm kind of easy to please in a lot of ways, but um, Me too. that's a good question, though. It's like, what is enough? I fully believe that, like, it is possible to do what you want to do, have the job you want to have and also be able to give yourself what is enough to you. My thing that catches me is like, I want to be able to give enough to every single person also involved in what I'm doing. And I would I would quicker sacrifice my enough to a lot less to make are you like talking about the dream of being garth brooks and calling your band on christmas eve and being like everybody (laughs) here's coming for no no no, you're coming for a surprise rehearsal (laughs) on christmas eve and they all get there and then you just hand them five hundred thousand dollars like he did see that is literally (laughs) but i'm telling you that's garth brooks that is what i want is that real it's real i (laughs) want to be able to be the indie garth brooks i want to give all my friends money and houses and cars do you want to be like here's this gonna be your new instagram bio (laughs) indie garth brooks (laughs) liza bolos just give them bolos i I already did but they didn't want to wear them Uh and and then i'm not gonna be that person who's like you have to wear them because i already dressed them in these jumpsuits that they now like but at the beginning they were like this kind of feels like a kid (laughs) you're gonna love it you're gonna love it because you don't have to think about what you're gonna wear i know they love it now they do but i did (laughs) i didn't i don't like the uniform thing in a being like being a person that wasn't a band i was just always like i don't know the uniform thing is like a lot 
Oh, I love it. I'm like, this is my show, baby. Show up. Show time. <laughs> well, you guys are fashionable. I'm sure you're helping yeah. elevate. No, but- no, no. My rule is three pieces. <clears throat> There you go. Oh, I yeah. love that. I mean, yours is yours is totally cute. I'm just saying, like, sometimes you're like, make the band dress in a certain way and it looks insane, you know? Like, oh, some yeah. people do that. Or, like, you look, look all, all my band must look like waiters, you know? It's like, come on, let's just, like, not do <laughs> this right now. <laughs> yeah. They all have napkins on their arms. Oh, my yeah, God. Well, uh, is there anything else on your mind about this topic? of you know the relationship between art and money while we're in the realm i mean my brain's so full about so many things i just think art is really hard i think that selling vintage art is easy money and art is where it gets weird making art if i was getting paid like what someone who works at spotify gets paid which i have heard is literally six fucking figures well, they have an office a big I, like, beautiful I office want it. i want if i was doing York that <sighs> but i'm still gonna make art for the rest of my life even though it's not that and then maybe one day it will be that who could know <laughs> i just think making something out of nothing is hard i think it about it hard. a lot and i and i and i think about like the older i get the more i think about like oh god listen to all this music like why what's the purpose of even putting something in in there I think that, you know, in the beginning, I was all like rushed to and like put it out there. And there's something beautiful about the music you make like that. But you get older and you sort of just it's it's really hard to keep, you know, keep the optimism and like not just say, you know, well, what, you know, I really think of, I think it's really hard. And I'll tell you why, because I sell vintage and that seems really easy and straightforward. And then I, making art and like carving and figuring that out. That is just, it's, you know, it's a challenge. It, it's its making something from nothing. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just don't feel like, um, you know, we, we diminish the value of it, but it's actually really, it's the highest form of um, learning. There's remembering, there's analy- there's there's remembering, there's reciting, analyzing, and you go up the hierarchy. The hardest thing to do is to create. Even if you're ultra talented like Liza, like and Tristan. it's easy. My point is, it's 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 actually a really difficult thing to do and to do well and to do and to find you, you know your voice and 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 where you're at with where I'm at where I'm trying to like you know not do the same thing I've always done you know kind of push things. Mm-hmm. It's just it's hard you know. Um, it's not as straightforward as selling houses or <laughs> selling vintage i mean yeah you're right um but it's you know it's it's healing and it's beautiful and it makes people feel things and and um even if it makes you feel something i mean and you never ever make any money off of it it doesn't make it any less valuable i don't know yeah well, we need to take care of the people who do all that work or they won't be able to do it anymore. Right. And what you're going to hear soon will just be robots making all the music. Or people with rich parents and like, I don't, I don't. what do they have to say? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they have. <laughs> right. They don't know. They okay. don't have, have any blues. They've never experienced the blues. So they don't, <laughs> they have no <laughs> suffering. And <laughs> so they have nothing to say. How can you make good music if you never suffered? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you can. But other writers will write it for you and make it look like you did. Well, oh. I think it's just you make the audience uh, not really know what's good and what's not good. And so they yeah. just kind of, you dumb it down so terribly that by the time it reaches the masses, they're comparing it to all other terrible music. And so nobody knows really what's what anymore. And yeah, it's hard to know. differentiate. It's all the output all the time. If someone's really talented, I'm like, oh man, they're so talented. It's going to be really hard for them. <laughs> I feel I feel that it makes me so sad. Like I have so many friends that I'm like, why are you not the literal biggest name in music right now? And well, because just, we make rock and roll, and it's like you know, it's like making polka. It's just a niche, mm-hmm. a niche uh, music. It is really niche, but it's it. also kind of the time for it. It's exciting, like Olivia Rodrigo, dude. Just gonna be honest. Bringing it back, opening she, it up. Yeah, really. I think there's going to be... It's in cycles, so you just have to in, stick around long enough to the music that you make becomes popular again and hope that you get like a foot in the door. Yeah. 
We're pulling for y'all. <laughs> hey, is me there, too. Is there a way that people can support you um, directly? Yeah, you can just buy our records. Yeah, buy our records. Yeah, and I I'm not mad if you stream them, but I think uh, you would really be a pal if you bought them. You yeah, know and if you come to the stream, shows. just like buy a T-shirt. We have so many. That's t-shirts. true. If you're gonna stream every stream, buy one shirt. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> I've got like five bucks to stream. <laughs> yeah, all kinds of swag. Yeah, and and coming to shows if you feel comfortable and open to now, that's like the best feeling. Also, tell your friends about it. Word of mouth. Bring that just back. Enjoy, just compliment us when you see us. No. Yeah, just tell us we look really hot. <laughs> tell us we look good. Tell us you like our eyes. <laughs> yeah, but I don't like yell at us from a car. Yeah, don't yell at me from a car. Don't catcall. Only women, actually, that part. Only you're the, think only you're hot. women are allowed to think I'm hot. <laughs> I have to like you back first. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just gross. <laughs> uh, read me my horoscope lightly while brushing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank this has been really fun. Hey, thanks um, for having us. has been fun. I feel good if you guys feel good. Yeah, that was awesome. Thanks cool. for all the amazing yeah, questions. Yeah, we really can gab. On. Oh my God, we'll <laughs> blather on for not going to Thanks for listening to Devalued. For more information about our podcast, please visit devalued.show.